Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rick Alling. I am the director of the Marston Exploration Theater. You see it in the background here. Um, uh, the Marston Exploration Theater and this program, Virtual Night Sky, are presented by a special team called the Community Outreach Group. And we're attached to the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And we are headquartered at the Tempe main campus of ASU. About nine months ago, uh, it happened to everybody. Our whole life was about bringing in uh, tons and tons of people, visitors filling the theater behind you, buses and buses and busloads of school kids coming in, visiting our program, active classes in the theater and dozens and dozens of presentations to thousands and thousands of people. Uh, of course, everything changed. And so during COVID, we're uh, participating in a totally different way. We didn't want to lose contact with our audience, so we decided to go virtual as much as we can. You guys are here, you are here, you found us. Uh, some of you already know we do this every other Wednesday night. We skipped over the holidays, but we're back. And uh, 2021, at least we've got ourselves scheduled and programmed up through June and into July. So you can expect to do this now every uh, every Wednesday at seven, every other Wednesday at seven o'clock. Uh, uh, I'm going to introduce the team that puts this together. Uh, you might or might not have already communicated with Kim Baptista. Kim is our webmaster and she's the one that keeps us organized. She uh, keeps the information flow going and she'll be able to troubleshoot problems if you have them uh, tonight, or at least we'll try to. She's also going to follow up after the program in a couple of days with a quick little survey. And we encourage you to take advantage of that do that, uh, make some comments, make some requests if you want to hear about something, and uh, or if you have an issue with what, we, uh, what we're talking about, let us know. Uh, we want to know, we want to hear from you. My colleague at uh, the school is Meg Hufford, and uh, she and I are the people that are in charge of making that programming for all of those thousands and thousands of people that usually come to visit us. We also use students often and all the time. And so two students are on board tonight to help us out. You have met them before if you've been part of these particular programs. Uh, Alicia Hyatt is going to help and, uh, and Alex Blanche is going to help. You might know we have a third student usually. We've given Sperty the week off. It's unheard of, but we did it. It's her birthday this week. And so uh, she's got some out of town visitors. She'll be back with us in two weeks. Uh, so more about upcoming events a little bit later. We've got some things going on. Here's how tonight's program is going to run. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what to look forward in 2021. We just thought this is a great opportunity. Uh, it's the beginning of the year. It's our first time meeting in the year of 2021. And uh, so we're going to talk to you about sort of like what to look forward to, what we're looking forward to astronomically, things that are going to happen in the sky that we'll be able to share with you over the year, uh, but also some missions. There's some milestones coming up, some very soon, uh, some uh, later in the year. We're just going to start tonight with an overview of what the, the um, uh, what the mission and the year looks like, the missions and astronomical phenomena. Uh, uh, then I'm just going to kind of give you a little primer on asteroids and where they are, types of asteroids, and I'm going to attach that to some of the missions uh, that we're going to talk about during the year. So a little bit about asteroids tonight, and then we'll take a break. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time with you uh, looking at our night sky. We're going to talk a lot of constellations. We're going to talk about the part of the night sky that is very visible right now, the best viewing in the wintertime in Phoenix, what we get to see, what to look for. I'm going to give you some things to watch for over the next couple of weeks, and uh, and we'll come back and, uh, and join every, we'll finish that, and we'll join everybody again in two weeks with another program. So uh, to get started, um, what I've done is we've asked Alex and Alicia uh, to come up with uh, just a quick little back and forth, uh, a little PowerPoint and a little program of things to look forward to. So I'm going to mute my microphone and turn my video off. I'm going to turn it over. Uh, I think Alex is first up with some of our information. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Hi, everybody. My name is Alex. I'm a sophomore undergrad at ASU in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, I major in astrophysics. So I study these things in space, what they are, how they form. And like Rick, Rick mentioned, we're going to be talking about the future of 2021 in terms of what you can see in the night sky. Um, that's eclipses, that's occultations, conjun conjunctions, sorry. And so we'll be looking at these events and um, I actually have a program pulled up called Stellarium and we'll get to show you some of these events when they're visible. Um, so let me share that screen real quick. 
So this is a free program called Stellarium. Uh, this is, you can, there are a couple links. There's a web browser based version, stellarium-web.org that you can just use in your browser. And then this full application, which is just stellarium.org. And this is a very, very um, uh, adaptable program for night sky viewing. And so we're actually gonna use it to view some, first we're gonna talk about some eclipses. So there are four eclipses in the year of 2021. There are gonna be two solar eclipses and two lunar eclipses. Now we're gonna get the solar eclipses out of the way first because unfortunately, at least for most of the world, we won't be able to see them. Um, the first one is an annular eclipse in June. And that one's, uh, it's the moon's a little farther away than for a total eclipse. So there's a kind of a bright ring around it. Um, but that can only really be viewed in parts of Northern Canada, Greenland and Russia. So very, very Northern. And then there's a total eclipse later on in December, but unless you are a crazy adventurer, you're probably not going to be able to see it because the only place you can see it on land is in Antarctica and every other place is the oceans around Antarctica. So it's, it's a very small path and in a pretty remote location. Now, lunar eclipses, this is a pretty good year to view lunar eclipses in North America. We actually have one on Mar on May 26th. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to zip forward to May 26th. This is May 26th, 2021. And the thing is, the timing's a little poor. It is very early in the morning. So you're either going to have to get up early, or if you're already up at that hour, stay up late. So this actually starts at about, this is like about 2.44 on May 26th. And this is actually visible in most of Northern and Southern America, um, Australia and Asia. Uh, but if you are outside of those regions, check your map, check your times. It's going to be different depending on that. But this is Phoenix time at 2.44 a.m. And so what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start passing time forward. And you can see now the shadow of the Earth is falling across the moon. You can see part of it's kind of black and part of it's this deep, deep red. It's kind of crimson. And that's because of our Earth's atmosphere. So it's going to start falling across it. And you're actually going to see the peak a little bit after 4. That's when it's going to be a total eclipse. And so this is going to be the full shadow covering it. And yeah, so just a little bit after 4, a few minutes after 4 is the peak. And you're going to reach the moment of totality. And this, it's interesting because this lunar eclipse is actually going to be, um, it's not like a solar eclipse where it's pretty easy to see. This is actually... Um, it's very dark. You'll be able to see a little bit of red, but maybe a little bit of edge lighting. Um, but this is May 26th, very early in the morning. And this is the total lunar eclipse. Now, on November 19th, there's a partial lunar eclipse. Uh, it can be seen in parts of North and South America, parts of Europe, Asia, and Australia. Um, this one's a little bit more widespread on the globe. Um, but it's only a partial, so you'll actually, you won't see this full display that I just showed you. It'll only be part of it. So it won't, you won't be able to see this image of totality. Um, but uh, May, tw May 26th is the total eclipse, and November 19th is the partial. And there are a lot of good resources online to check for these times and locations where you can see these. Uh, look for when they start, when the max is, when they end. Um, but the lunar eclipses are really what you'll be able to see this year. Solar eclipses, unfortunately, not so much. So now I'm going to pass it to my coworker, Alicia. She's going to talk a little bit about some missions happening this year, and then I'll be back for conjunctions and occultations. Thank you so much, Alex. Awesome. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, meteorites or meteor showers, I, or better said. Oh, I messed uh, that up. <laughs> what was that? Oh, I'm saying I messed it up. I said you're going to talk about missions, but it's meteor showers. Yes, yeah, so you're fine. You're doing great. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, meteor showers first. So uh, the first one we had was actually on January 3rd. So we, we were on holiday over that time. Um, but the next one coming up is actually on Earth Day. So April 22nd, we have the Lyrids coming. Um, and these are the crucial dates for meteor showers in 2021. Um, so like I said, April 22nd, then we have May 5th, the Eta Aquarids. Um, we also have in sometime in late July, Delta Aquarius. So make sure you're checking uh, your, you know, astronomy apps or just following us along on this journey. I'm sure we'll update you closer to the Delta Aquarius as to that exact date. Um, we also have August 12th. We have the Perse uh, Perse Persids, excuse me. Uh, and then October 8th, we, October 8th, we have the Draconids, excuse me. 
uh, following that, we have October 12th. So just over halfway through our year, or a little more than halfway through our year, we have the Orionids on the 21st. And then in November on the 4th and 5th, we have the South Torrids uh, with followed on the 11th and 12th with the North Torrids. Um, and wrapping up in November, we have the Leonoids. Uh, and then December 13th and 14th, we have the Geminids followed with our last meteor shower of 2021, which will be the Ursids. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to pass it right back off to Alex to go ahead and finish his section on conjunctions and oculation. Okay, perfect. So we're going to go right back into Stellarium um, and we're going to talk about, like Elise said, conjunctions and occultations. So if those words aren't familiar for you, conjunctions are kind of alignments in planets as seen from Earth. We just had one back in December, the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, the closest they've been in about 400 years. That was very exciting. But we have a couple this year as well. Um, we have two actually, but they aren't. Um, only one of them is visible. So the first one's actually in about a week. Actually, exactly a week. Yeah, I got my math right. No, I don't. I don't. In about a week. Um, it's between Mars and Uranus. And that will not be visible mainly because... Uh, we can't see Uranus with the naked eye and even telescopes. It's incredibly far away, in them, and so we can't actually pick it up. But you can't see Mars. So if you look up January 21st and you see Mars, just imagine Uranus kind of close by, just out there in the void of space. But what we can see is what you can see right here. This is actually going to be on um, July 13th. And this is the uh, conjunction between Mars and Venus. So this is um, a few days before this. As you can see, Mars and Venus are labeled there. But as we start moving forward by a couple days, it'll actually see, you'll actually see them start to get closer and closer and closer. And so on the day of the conjunction, it's not as close as Jupiter and Saturn were during their conjunction, but this is actually how it'll look. Mars and Venus will be right next to each other. They'll be bright in the night sky. Um, pretty early horizons, probably going to be your best bet to see this because they will set um, very closely to when it actually gets dark. So you'll have to catch them when... Uh, it's dim enough to where you can see them, but not to the point where they've set. Um, but so um, July 13th, uh, kind of 8 o'clock, and not just, don't just view it on the 13th, you know, stretch it out maybe a week after and before. That way you can see them moving together and then moving apart. That's where the really neat parts of this conjunctions come into. So that's kind of the end of our visible events, unfortunately. We also have occultations, which is when the moon passes in front of planets and near planets. Um, there are three. There's one with Mars, Venus, and another one with Mars. But all of these occur at times of year and times of day where it's really not possible to see them from where we are uh, here in uh, the United States and Arizona. Again, a lot of these events, the time changes depending on where you are. So make sure to check you know, uh, online resources to find those. But there's one on April 17th with Mars. There's one on November 7th with Venus. And then the last day of the year, um, December 31st, there's another one with Mars. So those are occultations. They're not commonly visible here in North America. You might get lucky if you can. And that's just kind of neat to see the planets either uh, near the moon or around there. Um, but make sure with all these events, make sure to check online resources to see where your locations and where your timings might, dare, uh, might differ. Um, here in Arizona, this is kind of all we, we presented since we are Arizona State University, but make sure to check out all of these and try and see if you can find them. Um, but yeah, so that's all the astronomy events for this year. Now we will go to the missions with Alicia. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Um, and really quick, uh, we forgot to mention earlier that we do have a polling slash question and answer section. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and type them in our Q&A and we will address them when we can. Um, and if we don't address them uh, in front of the group, we will try and address them in uh, privately on the, the keyboard. So please make sure you're filling out those Q&A if you have any questions. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about missions. Um, and so the first uh, important date I want to talk to you about is coming up pretty quick here on February 9th. It's the HOPE mission arrival, and we'll talk about the HOPE mission shortly. Uh, following that is February 18th. We have the Mars 2020 uh, landing. 
that we're going to also discuss in just a moment. October 16th, so quite a bit of time in between those, uh, but on October 16th we have the Lucy mission launch, which is very exciting. ASU is a part of that mission as well, so all three of these. Um, and then something super exciting, you are all VIP members to a special event tomorrow, um, January 14th at 5 p.m. It's the NASA Lucy mission talk. So it is hosted by the National Science Teaching Association, um, featuring ASU scientists, Dr. Don Donald Johnson and Dr. Hal Levis Levison. Um, and so we're going to put that link in the chat in just a moment, but this is just a really nice talk um, to get to know the ins and outs of this mission and you are all invited and it's free. You just have to um, register for an account, I believe. So um, all that information will be in the link that will drop down below. All right, so moving back to missions, these three missions, the Emirates or HOPE mission, the Mars 2020 rover, and the Lucy mission are all really important here at ASU because we have some part in that. And so with the HOPE mission, we're really excited because this is an uncrewed space mission to the red planet or to Mars. Um, and it's mainly meant to study seasonal weather changes or other atmosphere phenomenons that we're really excited to be able to um, monitor and take da data and science on. Uh, for the Mars 2020 rover, obviously that launched last year, we're in 2021, um, but now we get a lot more information coming soon. So um, it launched in July and it's actually named the Perseverance rover. Uh, and what's really neat about the Perseverance rover is that this time there's actually a little counterpart. It is a flying helicopter named Ingenuity, um, which is a new addition and we're very excited. Uh, and ASU is really uh, awesome in that we built the camera or two of the cameras on MassCam, uh, or on, excuse me, on the Perseverance rover. We built two of them, um, and they're called MassCam Z because they're two cameras that attach to the mast and they can zoom. So we're really excited to be a part of that and actually start getting the images from that mission pretty, hopefully pretty soon. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, we have the Lucy mission, which ASU is also a part of. And this is the first mission to study tr um, Trojan asteroids. And what's really exciting about these Trojan asteroids or about asteroids in general is that it's kind of a, a time machine back or I said that weird, but it's kind of like going back in time and studying early solar system formation um, because you know there's not a lot of weather eroding that's happening on these asteroids. And so we get to see them how they were millions of years ago and not how um, things are currently like on the earth, how we have eroding and stuff. So we're really excited to kind of look back in time and um, take a look at these asteroids with the Lucy mission. Alrighty, well, with that being said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna go ahead and launch our first poll. So I'll go ahead and put that up. And if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A now. And I think Alex is gonna take those in a moment. But the first question I have for you is, what current grade level are you in school? Um, so we're asking, are you in pre-K through sixth grade, seventh through eighth, ninth through 12th? Um, are you in college or are you a lifelong learner? So go ahead and um, cast your votes down below for what category. And then Alex, if you have any uh, live questions, we can go ahead and take those now. Um, so we don't have any, any, any unanswered questions, but I will elaborate on um, Patricia's question of, of, is the number of meteor showers normal or something else going on? And that's a really good question. Um, Right now, there are a good bit of meteor showers this year. Some of those are annual meteor showers. Some of them aren't. It's very dependent on how we orbit in the solar system and how they orbit. Uh, it's just kind of when we fly through each other. Um, so some of them are annual meteor showers that we get to see every year. Um, and some of them are. It, it, and also, the intensity varies depending on the year, the time of year, too, and how frequent they are. But yeah, good question. And that's really all we have right now. Hopefully, we will get some for our later question and answer break. We'll have one closer to the end of the program. So if you have any questions, we'll still answer them there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. And I'm going to go ahead and end our poll. Uh, and so with that being said, our poll identified that most of us at 81% are lifelong learners. So uh, regardless of whatever your current grade level is in school, we are happy to have you here. Uh, and Rick, I'm going to go ahead and pass things back off to you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, looking forward to a lot of these things. It's going to be a really great astronomical year. And I wanted to just sort of like, just remind you all of those things we cover along the way. So we'll give you announcements as we go forward about phenomenon, things that are happening. We'll do a special attraction sort of phenomenon about that lunar eclipse in May for sure. And <clears throat> some other things as we go. And uh, then I'd also add to uh, Alex's explanation of, of meteor showers. Uh, uh, many times, uh, so the, the, the meteor showers are about the same time uh, every year, uh, but oftentimes the moon will get in the way. So we like to find meteor showers, especially uh, affect, uh, aggressive meteor showers, the ones with a lot of meteor showers, also at a time when the moon isn't in the sky. And so from year to year to year, that changes quite a little bit. Sometimes we have really good ones sometimes not so great. So we'll watch for those, keep you up to date on what to watch for, when to look for them. And uh, I'm, I'm counting on everybody to get up in the middle of the night and look at that, uh, that lunar eclipse in May. So I think that's a holiday weekend, actually, if I think about it right. I'm going to share a, a different screen with you. I wanted to, uh, as promised, give you a little sort of uh, a little uh, background on asteroids, where they are. So I'm going to kind of focus on uh, types of asteroids, where we find them. I'm going to kind of try to relate that to the missions that we were just talking, that uh, Alicia was talking about, and see where we go from there. Uh, so what you're seeing here on the screen is uh, uh, this is part of the uh, computer system and the programming that we uh, we use in the Marston Theater. Uh, there, this is a big, huge, gigantic full screen. It's like a movie theater, and we do things in 3D. So imagine watching the moon sort of like recede from you in, in 3D. That would be very, very cool. Uh, I'm going to kind of just back out. I'm actually running this thing as as we talk. So I'm just going to kind of add uh, some orbits. Today we're going to just really highlight the orbit of Earth and <clears throat> Uh, the orbit of Jupiter um, and kind of get those into place, into view. And my Earth orbit didn't turn on right, so I'm going to kind of go back and get that one. Um, and uh, let me just sort of like get out to the perfect view that I'm looking for here. We went too far while I was trying to do that. And sorry, sometimes this just flies perfectly and everything's good. And uh, while I'm doing this, I'm also going to blow up these planets. I mean, I'm not going to explode them. I'm going to make Earth uh, really big uh, so we can see it much better in the sky. Uh, uh oh, that was too big. Excuse me, folks. There we go. Yeah, the Earth is back in place. And uh, then uh, I'm also going to blow up Jupiter really big because we want to see that big in the night sky as well. And so I think everybody uh, sort of remembers maybe from grade school or maybe from uh, sort of the common understanding about asteroids uh, that most of them are located in the area between these two planets. Uh, so uh, it's the main asteroid belt. It's actually in uh, multiple parts. We kind of call it the close ones, the next, the middle ones and the far ones. And uh, it, by far, the most asteroids we find in the sky uh, sort of like take up this particular position. You can sort of see as I fly around here, uh, you can see Earth, uh, the sun in the middle, Jupiter on the outside, and, and the asteroid belt in the middle. Uh, that doesn't mean all of them are there. Let me just sort of like turn on just a couple that are kind of more like near Earth. And you'll see that uh, um, although most of the asteroids are in the asteroid belt, there are some that just fly right around the Earth and in our orbit. A couple of months ago, we talked about a mission called OSIRIS-REx and a couple in, in, in December or late uh, November, uh, the Japanese were able to add, uh, uh, talk to us about a mission or had a mission milestone. Uh, both of those are visits to near Earth orbiting asteroids. OSIRIS-REx was a snatch and grab. We grabbed some, uh, some asteroid information, put it in a probe and it's on its way home. Uh, the Hayabusa mission that was launched by Japan actually received asteroid uh, 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 
rocks and, and debris that they brought home to Japan and opened it up. And we'll start to investigate that as we go forward. So, so that's kind of important. Uh, one um, asteroid mission that we always talk about because it's got ASU footprints on it is this one at the very, very outer part of the main asteroid belt. This is called Psyche. Psyche is a spacecraft that's being built right now, but the mission itself to go to this asteroid and discover what it's about is actually run by uh, the principal investigator is ASU. Her name is Lindy Elkins Tanton, and she is uh, is the PI, which is the, the lead uh, science researcher for this particular mission. We're looking forward to it. It doesn't launch in not this year, but it launches next year. I always want to keep it in front of us because you're going to hear a lot more about Psyche and that mission uh, going forward. Now, Alicia mentioned a mission that is actually one I, one I wanted to highlight today. Um, leading and following the orbit of Jupiter out in that part of space, can you see all those sort of like yellow grouping of asteroids? Those are the ones, those are called Trojan asteroids. And uh, they are different from the ones in the main belt. First of all, they're a lot further away. The Lucy mission, which launches uh, in, uh, uh, in later in the year, October 21st, I think was the date, uh, will start heading for these particular asteroids. I put... Um, uh, an image here, let me just call it up. I have an image that sort of shows you the, the wild flight path to get to this particular asteroid area. So look at this. So, so um, <clears throat> these areas right here are called the Trojans and they're, uh, they fall into these, what they call Lagrange points. They are in the orbit of Jupiter. Uh, they lead and follow, as I said. So as Jupiter goes around in its orbit, these asteroids just kind of trail on behind it or lead it in orbit. And you can see here, uh, this Lucy mission, we're gonna leave the Earth and fly out. There's going to be a flyby of an asteroid right here called asteroid Don Johansson. That won't be, I wrote down the date so I could tell you when that is. We're not gonna see that until April of 2025. So launch, it'll get out here, and then uh, we'll use that to calibrate the cameras, and then the mission takes the uh, Lucy spacecraft all the way out to this Lagrange point, and multiple asteroids will be seen here, and then, as if that wasn't enough, we're going to come back across uh, the center of the solar system, and then back out uh, to the other Lagrange area, Lagrange L5, and uh, visit another asteroid over here. The reason all of this is, is, is important and the reason that all of this is uh, uh, kind of new and groundbreaking is, uh, as, as Alicia was saying, asteroids tell us something about our early solar system that we just can't get from our own planet. And asteroids are, uh, are the, ta the taxonomy of asteroids are they are different types. They are made up of different kinds of materials. We think the Trojans are some of the oldest, most ancient asteroids in our solar system. Uh, and they fall into a category of, uh, of what they call D-type and E-type. Those asteroids have never been imaged closely. We understand them, we see them telescopically, we do all that, but, but we have, of all the asteroids we've flown very, very close to, and there have been many issue, is, uh, missions um, that do asteroid research, uh, these particular Lagrangian asteroids that are out in the orbit of Jupiter are different, made of different material, have a different birth right, they come from a, a, a different period of time, and it'll be the first time that these things have ever been seen. So what a wild mission. And the excitement of it is that we have uh, at ASU, we're building a camera, there will be a thermal spectric spec, uh, uh, imaging spectrometer, and uh, it will help us understand the type of materials that is encrusted on these asteroids and kind of what makes them tick in space. So I just wanted to give you that view. One more thing I'm gonna try to do, I did this before the show because it's kind of pretty, is kind of get back to the earth and then turn around kind of like look at all that stuff in space, all we have to explore. So we've seen the planets, we've seen, uh, uh, we've been to the moon, we've done all of this stuff, but there just seems to be great interest right now in these little tiny bodies, the small bodies uh, that surround us and uh, that are in space between us and Jupiter. And, uh, and that's kind of a little sort of uh, uh, explanation of why this is exciting and where we're going. All right, I am going to stop share that because I'm probably tired of looking at the side of my face. So I have to actually kind of change positions to use the, um, that particular system. Uh, so I'm back. Uh, so team, do we have another break now or do we want to go right into the constellations? You tell me.
Hello. Rick, I think uh, you can go right into the conversation. Go right in. Okay, I couldn't remember if we had another little question. Uh, so I'm going to actually sort of launch yet another computer. Technology is sort of working for us right now. This one takes just a little bit to sort of get organized. I'm going to go to a, uh, a program that I like to use, go to, similar to uh, what Alex was showing us, but uh, but this is called Sky Safari, uh, Sky Safari Pro in this particular case. This one happens to not be free, but it's also not that expensive. I think it's uh, it's only about 15 or $20 and uh, it shows a lot about the night sky. Uh, the view I'm going to start with is one that we don't usually see. Sometimes we do this in programming. Sometimes we'd like to sort of like orient right to a horizon. But what you're seeing here is everything that is within that center ring, right? Not the green stuff off to the sides, but everything with the, within the center ring is in the sky right now. And so this is set up for today at seven o'clock. So when we started our program, uh, this was there. And so uh, anything that you can see that is not green is available to you to look at in the night sky. Now I'm going to oops, press the wrong button. I'm going to actually sort of like just move us around here. And I'm going to concentrate on the area uh, that is kind of towards the east in the southeast. And let me just give you a little sort of uh, perspective of how much of this area we're going to talk about today. I like uh, uh, to use a little sort of pen here to do this. So I'm going to kind of just take a little screenshot. And I'm going to turn the eraser off. So I'm going to kind of just kind of show you around this whole part of the sky. This is where you're going to look. And, and you can see from this image, actually, let me get back out to the screenshot. You can see from the whole sky view in that particular region of the sky, the one I just circled there, there's, a, there's many, many, many bright stars. And that's really why this is exciting. This is an exciting time of year. There's lots to look at here. Uh, let me go back again, kind of just get myself organized into this area. And uh, to give first, I'm just going to give you a quick little overview on what's here and why we're going to see it. So uh, starting up here, and we'll talk about these constellations in a little bit more depth as I go. So starting up here uh, is the constellation of Aries. And you might know it's the first constellation of the zodiac cycle, and it's the ram, right? And then next in line, sort of like just little sort of V shape, sort of big bowl horns that come up this way. Um, you probably know already what this is. It's Taurus. And uh, this is the second uh, constellation of the zodiac in the line, and it's Taurus the bull. And then right between it, right here in this particular part of the sky, is, um, of course, you probably already have guessed the next uh, uh, constellation. And the zodiac line is Gemini, and this one is the twins. So I'm going to go, like I say, I'm going to kind of do deeper dives into all of these, tell you sort of like how to find them, what to look for, a little bit of mythology, some stories about these particular things, just kind of give you an overview of, of where we're heading tonight. There's another constellation up here, and uh, it uh, is not uh, that distinguishable as a constellation. It's fairly bright. People see it all the time, and it's called Orija. Orija is, um, oops, or Orija, spelling. I'm going to get, um, I'm going to ask Alicia to kind of help me with spare spell check. Um, and then I'm going to talk about its brightest star that we actually call the goat star. And then I'm going to show you how to look for a bunch of little uh, goats, little kids in that particular constellation. In this part of the sky, we're going to talk about an asterism we call the winter triangle. And it is in this part of the sky. And it uh, is a triangle between uh, a star called Betelgeuse. You probably have seen that. A star called Procyon. You probably, you might or might not know that that is the... Uh, um, uh, the star of the uh, uh, the little dog and Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. And then everybody knows this constellation. Alicia was sort of, and Spoo gave you a really good explanation about the constellation, what to look for when it started appearing in our sky last December. And uh, Alicia, if you wouldn't mind, can you help me with the spelling of this one? Yeah, so this constellation is Orion and it's O apostrophe R Y A N. And it is an Irish constellation. Oh, I see. Orion. I don't know. I don't think that's right. And I'm not sure you can do jokes and zoom because we can't hear anybody laughing. So no, I'm sort you of know, like, ha 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 ha. I, I'm okay, an good. Thank major, you. Not, not a spelling major. 
<laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so the constellation Orion. So this is sort of the part of the sky we're covering. What is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, constellations. Uh, I also, I guess I should probably show you, you remember Alex mentioned that there was going to be a conjunction between Mars and Uranus. And he is absolutely right. The Uranus is not a, a planet that is visible uh, to the naked eye. Uh, you can see it through a, a hobby telescope. It's a, it's a little bit difficult to find, but once found, you can tell it's a planet. Uh, it is just too dim uh, for us to see, even in the best conditions. Uh, I guess actually technically in a clear, 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 super clear sky, and you know exactly what to look for, you might be able to see it, but not from the city of Phoenix. Not uh, And you can see how, how close those two stars are, or those two planets are. Are. And uh, that's obviously because uh, they're just about to be um, a conjunction. So I'm going to sort of get rid of all of this stuff. And now I'm going to just show you a slightly different view. Let me get some of these stars on. And then remember, I was talking about this particular area, um, kind of showing us the brightest stars in the sky. Uh, let me just sort of screenshot that for a second. And so star brightness is uh, designated by magnitude. And it's kind of a backward scale. So we talked about this a little bit at another show, but the brightest stars are a magnitude one, if you want, first magnitude. And there are many of those up there. Uh, and then they sort of get uh, second magnitude stars are a little dimmer and third are a little dimmer and fourth are a little dimmer than that. Uh, what I did today is I looked up the 24 brightest stars in the sky, and I'm going to show you in this particular chart how they fall into the sky right here. And so if I could, I'm going to make this big enough so we can all see. Uh, Sirius is... <clears throat> the brightest scar in the night sky, north and south and everywhere. It's it's the bright one. And you'll see it tonight, right after this show, just go out and kind of look towards the southeast. Absolutely, it'll be there. And it will anchor one of those corners of that triangle I was talking about. Um, uh, let's see what else. So Capella is actually the fifth brightest star in the sky. I'm sorry, got it wrong. It's the sixth. Hang on. I want to be right, I'm just checking my work here, is the fifth brightest star in the sky. That was the one we called the goat star. Rigel is going to be seventh. Procyon is going to be eighth. Betelgeuse, tenth. Aldebaran up here is going to be 14th. Um, this one is called uh, Pollux at 17. And Castor, the other twin, is at 24. So these are, this is, if we take uh, the range of stars, the 24 brightest ones anywhere in the sky, and you can see about a third of the 24 brightest stars are actually in this particular collection of stars and constellations. So when people come to me and say the stars were especially bright last night, or uh, the stars looked amazing tonight, I can usually tell they're looking in winter. They're looking at the night sky in January, February, or March, because this is when these are available to us. And so it's a perfect time for me to introduce some of these constellations and have you go sort of like look for some of the features and then uh, uh, we'll talk about them again in about 10 weeks. And we're going to talk about the same constellations, but at that one, it's our uh, first uh, Wednesday in March meeting. Um, we're actually going to kind of talk a little bit more about um, uh, not only these, uh, these particular stars, but... Um, Oops, sorry, I got a little sort of flag there. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the science behind them and their color and that kind of thing. So let's learn them now, go out and find them and see where we go from there. Okay, back up to Aries. Uh, of all of these, it's going to be the hardest to find. Uh, it is uh, really the, the part you can see from Phoenix um, is uh, uh, is uh, essentially just this, this little sort of like uh, shape like this. That's it. Um, the constellation actually also goes into some dimmer stars over in this direction. And so sometimes you can find those, but uh, importantly, uh, the, the constellation is just this, this little sort of, uh, let me get the lines out of the way again. Oops, let me get the lines out of the way again uh, so you can see what this looks like. So Aries is the ram. It's also associated with the golden fleece, which I guess makes a certain amount of sense. The golden fleece was the, the treasure 
treasure that launched the voyage of uh, Jason and the Argonauts. Um, they uh, took a, all of the heroes of the day on the same ship, the uh, Argo Navis, and they sailed uh, uh, to the land to get the Golden Fleece. And you remember Jason had several tasks that he had to do. Uh, it's a big story. If you want to go back and look at that mythology, it's certainly available to you in, in, uh, in books and on the internet. But this is really sort of where this comes from. Aries also plays a very important role in our day and our yearly cycle because when the sun moves into Aries, uh, that's when we sort of think of the very first day of spring. So in March the 22nd. That has changed a little bit uh, over uh, over the years because of precession, but it's still that time of year when Aries sets into the sunset, which will be somewhere in March. Uh, we'll actually sort of uh, then measure that as the first day of spring, and it starts that cycle all over again. For many cultures, the first day of spring and the first uh, uh, day that the sun is in Aries began was the new year, and it was uh, the thing that started the cycles of growing and the seasons and all that stuff. So it plays an important role in history, an important role in mythology, uh, but it's, um, uh, 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 it's, it's kind of a conspicuous, it's not a very conspicuous constellation to try to find. So uh, let me just sort of move on down here a little bit. I'm going to show you another sort of part of the sky. Oops. <clears throat> Don't want to draw things that I can't. And also, also uh, when you find Aries, or this is a great time to look for Aries, because uh, Mars is right there. So Mars will be the reddish object that's in this part of the sky, and uh, you've been watching it for months. It's getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as it gets further and further away from the Earth. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, I don't know why that thing keeps coming up. So I will sort of, sort of change position here and see if I can do that. Um, uh, moving on, I want to just kind of like show you one of my favorite constellations, not because it happens to be my sign of the zodiac, but because it's really easy to find and see, is the constellation of Taurus. Um, uh, oops, sorry about that. <clears throat> kind of losing, um, losing my grip here. Uh, so, uh, and what it is marked by this really bright orange star called Aldebaran. And, and what I look for in Taurus is a little shape like this. There's a V in the sky. And if you take those Vs and it sort of extend out in this particular direction, you're going to have one horn of the bowl. Uh, if you go up this direction, you got the other horn of the bowl. Uh, this is a fairly bright star called El Nath. And the little cluster that is formed right here in that V is actually an open cluster of stars. Aldebaran is a star that is very close to us in front of that cluster. Um, um, but the cluster itself is also fun to look at. So I'm going to just take us there for a moment. And uh, delete this. Oop. I'm going to select that particular object and uh, center it. And then kind of move us out here. What you see here as we get a little bit closer, Aldebaran in this particular part of the, at the lower left part of this little cluster, uh, like I say, is closer to us than the others. It's not part of that cluster, but in, in this area, there's a very, very rich uh, open cluster of stars. Open clusters are stars that formed about the same time. Uh, they're really beautiful to look at with binoculars or a telescope. There's thousands of them in this cluster. It has a name called the Hyades. And this particular cluster is, uh, is kind of part of the face of the bowl. Uh, there is another open cluster in this area, and people probably know it. Uh, you've seen this before. It's called, uh, uh, it's called the Pleiades. Sometimes we call it the Seven Sisters. And let me just sort of show you where it is related to the rest of Taurus, because it doesn't really um, necessarily fall right into um, uh, the constellation. So remember the face is going to be here. This is going to be like a little V shape. I'm going to pull the horns out again. And just up above this, a little bit higher in the sky right here, is that uh, little cluster of stars we call the Pleiades. The Pleiades has, has played in all kinds of different ways throughout uh, uh, the uh, uh, mythology, throughout cultures. Every culture has a story about the Pleiades, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, I keep getting this thing and I don't exactly know what's making it happen, but I'm going to try to work my way through it. So, um, so Taurus the bull 
is the next one and I want you to find it. And I want you to sort of also to uh, find the Pleiades. And then I have a special little assignment for you. And we'll check with you in two weeks uh, when you come back again and see what's going on. Uh, what I want you to do is see how many stars in this area you can see. So we call it the Seven Sisters. Uh, but actually, if I can show you a little bit more about this particular area and this particular function, um, uh, this is actually multiple stars. In this particular area right here, this is called Atlas and Cleone. And this is, if you want, dad and mom. This is the father and the mother. Um, and the seven sisters are actually uh, one, two, three, four, five six, seven. Um, and so, but you don't necessarily see nine objects when you look up at this particular object. In fact, most people just see six. And uh, so that's fairly important to, to kind of understand. Um, and what I wanted to do is just have you see, uh, some people see six objects, some people see uh, eight objects, uh, very rarely does somebody see seven objects, if you want to look at it that way. And so I'm going to suggest that what you actually sort of see in the stars is these two look at like one, here's two, here's three, here's four, here's five, and here's six. And so I think this is sort of what the shape looks like. Uh, the other stars either blend in with brighter ones or you can't see them at all. Uh, so I don't want to give away too much. Your assignment is sometime between now and two weeks from now. I want everybody to just go out and just study this. Look at hard as you can, see what you can see, uh, find the little cluster. Uh, you'll know it's the Pleiades because it's the only thing like it in the sky. It's in the constellation Taurus, and it's very, very near the head of the bowl, and uh, and that's a good place to be. Uh, th the last constellation I sort of want to go into some depth on is Gemini. Uh, Gemini also plays in history. It's the twins, uh, you guys, and the twins were also uh, coincidentally on uh, the voyage, Jason and the, and the Argo, um, and uh, they sort of just kind of fall in this particular sky to the sky. Let me try to just sort of like give you a little positioning here. So they have their heads up in this particular way. Let me do a little body down here and a leg going up this way and this way. An arm, the head of the other twin is over here and he's got his little legs down here. One usually has an arm wrapped around the other um, and, uh, and that's how they fly in the sky. I don't know if you could see this or not, but there's a little sort of like hazy little sort of part of the sky right here is the Milky Way. The twins are usually thought of as standing on the Milky Way. Uh, some say that the Milky Way was cattle and uh, the twins actually sort of like stole some cattle and were running away. It's one of their stories. The story I like the most about the twins and about uh, um, the Gemini is that when they were on the ship, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of St. Elmo's fire. Have you ever heard that before? St. Elmo's fire is a phenomenon. It happens. It happens uh, on ships. It happens during thunderstorms. And it happens when there's a lot of electrical activity in the sky. And then things that are metal that are passing through that sky, like you can imagine the masts of a ship as it's sort of like moving across the ocean with all of this thunder and lightning going on, it, it makes them glow. It actually fluoresces uh, the oxygen and nitrogen in the air. And uh, they call it St. Elmo's fire. It's like this little plasma sort of shape, green and blue. And it's actually it's very beautiful. Uh, uh, St. Elmo is the name, is another name for St. Erasmus. And he is sort of the known as the patron saint of sailors. And so sailors, when they saw this, they weren't fearful. It was just kind of a sign uh, that they were going to be all right. Uh, so, uh, so Gemini, I just love that particular part of the story is that they played an important role because uh, they were sort of on that ship the St. Elmo's fire uh, flowed around their heads and, uh, and kind of up the mass and around all this stuff. And the sailors just sort of thought that these guys, these twins were helping them navigate. They were uh, kind of making them safe. They were calming the waters. And so that's just one of many, many, many ways to see Gemini. Uh, the stars here uh, are not exactly twin. Procyon, I'm sorry, uh, Pollux is the lowest one here. 
um, and uh, Pollux, oh gosh, I should probably have checked how to spell that one. And Castor is the other one. Those are the names of the twins. Um, I always know the difference between Castor usually leads. They're in alphabetical order. So Castor is going to rise first. Pollux is going to fall. It's also in the Western sky, going to set first. And Pollux is going to fall, um, uh, is going to follow. Uh, and, and those are the twins. They're slightly different color. Uh, they are slightly different um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, brightnesses. Uh, Pollux a little bit brighter than Castor, but those are the twins and those are the ones that you can look for. There is another reference in early star charts to Castor and Pollux being Apollo and Hercules. And Castor was Apollo, and Hercules was, or Pollux was, was Hercules. And you see in some of those star charts, um, the, um, uh, they sort of describe them, Poly or Hercules was carrying like a sickle or a club, and sort of like a strong man, like sort of like was, would do, uh, ready to go into battle. And, and Apollo is usually carrying a harp and uh, a sheath of arrows. Uh, Apollo was also the god of archery and of music. And so, so you see that every once in a while. Lots of stories embedded in the night sky and uh, the first three constellations of the zodiac, Aries, Taurus, and Gemini, they're easy to find. Uh, certainly you'll find the little V in the sky that will help direct you to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, Taurus. And you'll see the twins sort of below, uh, nearer the horizon than there. I'm just gonna take you up here because I got another little thing for you to find. And this will be great for the kids. I know there were some kids on board. Uh, Capella is a very, very bright star and it's very much like our sun. It's about the same color temperature. Uh, it's bigger than our sun by far, and it is really an easy star to find. Two things about uh, Arija, the constellation, and Capella, the star, uh, that would be kind of fun to talk about is, first of all, uh, the shape, like happens, I think we talked about this before, uh, with Pegasus and uh, with uh, uh, Andromeda. Uh, it's kind of these two constellations, Taurus and Arija, they actually share uh, one of the stars. This one right here called El Nath is also the point of one of the bull's horns. They come out like this. Remember we did this before. Uh, and it is also part of the chariot that makes up the constellation um, uh, Arija. Uh, that doesn't explain anything about why Capella is known as the goat star. But oftentimes in ancient uh, charts, again, is what you see is uh, the driver or the chariot is carrying this goat guy. And the goat guy um, also has little goats in uh, his, um, his arm. And so uh, we call this little tiny cluster of stars right here, there's a little triangle of stars that is next to this bright star, easy to find again. I think this, my machine thinks I'm actually trying to give it a, a thing it doesn't want to do. If you find those three stars, they are called the kids. And so if you don't know this already, baby goats are called kids. Uh, Capella, known as the goat star, and right next to the goat star in the sky. These are fairly easy to find. I was out the other night walking my dog, and I wanted to just make sure you guys could see it and find them before I had the program tonight. So, uh, so that is uh, part of that story. Um, so we talked now about uh, the three constellations of the zodiac that we wanted to talk about tonight. We talked uh, about about Arija. And now let me go back to this triangle again and just sort of show you what, what happens. Uh, oftentimes there are asterisms in the sky and uh, we've talked about them before. There is a summer triangle that is made up of three very, very bright stars in three different constellations. That one is Cygnus the Swan, Vega the Harp, and Aquila the Eagle. Uh, that is actually setting mostly sort of on the western part of the sky. Vega is still up, but the rest of the stars are already below the horizon. So it's a constellation or an asterism group of constellations we see in the summertime, uh, and now it's gone. But replacing it now, rising above the eastern horizon early in the evening, is this exceptionally bright triangle of stars I mentioned before. And it's almost a perfect equilateral triangle. Remember that the sides being of equal distances uh, is important. And so that's really what that is. 
Uh, Beetlejuice, as you already know, is the upper shoulder of the giant of Orion. Uh, uh, and then uh, the other uh, corner of Orion, if you want, across the three belt stars is the star called Rigel. Those are really easy to find. The whole of the constellation uh, Orion is very easy to find, whether you're Irish or English. And uh, uh, then the other two stars, <coughs> as part of this particular system are, um, uh, are uh, two other constellations. Sirius is called the dog star. So we've already talked a little bit about the goat star, uh, but this one is called the dog star and it's part of a constellation um, that uh, uh, is halfway below the horizon right here. It actually looks like this. It's called Canis Major and it's the big star. So wait a little bit longer in an hour or two. So this was seven o'clock at eight o'clock, maybe by the time you get out there tonight, you'll find Sirius, but try to look for these other stars that are associated and you'll try to get a bit of more of a magnitude of the whole of the constellation. Uh, so uh, Sirius and its partner star up here are above the horizon and then trailing it behind it are some lower stars that are part of uh, the bottom part. Uh, uh, the dog's head is up in this direction. His legs come out this particular way. I can't draw a dog to save my life, but, uh, but you can sort of see how that works works right there. Uh, Procyon is um, the alpha star of the little dog, Canis Minor. So just like bears, we have an Ursa Major and a Canis Major. Uh, in star life, we have uh, 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 Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. In, star, in the dog world, we have Ursa, I'm sorry, Canis Major and Canis Minor. If you start at Procyon right here uh, and just go up and try to find these, there's three little stars in a little tiny group right here. Uh, so uh, the first one is fairly easy to see. And then if you look really close, you'll probably find they kind of take on a shape like that. And that's it. Uh, that's all there is to that constellation. I don't think you can make a dog out of it if you, uh, if unless you use a lot of imagination. Uh, but uh, Procyon is easy to find. I think you remember. I already said it's the eighth brightest star in the sky. Um, Betelgeuse, the tenth brightest star in the sky. It's Sirius, the brightest star there is. And so between those three objects. Uh, if we kind of connect them together, uh, that's where you get that winter triangle and, uh, and it's easy to find and, and, and uh, fun to look for. Okay, so I'm going to do just a little bit of a review. I've been talking a lot here and then we're going to have another little break and uh, then we'll wrap up. Uh, so uh, what you're going to look for, the things that you need to find are uh, Taurus the bull for sure. The Hyades is this open cluster that's anchored by uh, Aldebaran, the redder star. Um, you're gonna, um, and so that's going to be right here and Aldebaran right there. You're going to find the Pleiades and you're going to do your little assignment where you look to see how many stars and Pleiades, Pleiades you can actually find. You're going to find the goat star and look for the kids because they are right here, a little triangle right next to the main star, uh, the main goat star, uh, and there's the kids. You're going to name uh, the, 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 um, the twins, Castor and Pollux, and which one is top and which one is bottom. Uh, you'll have to sort of remember that. And while you're at it, you're going to look for the big, huge triangle in the sky and identify Sirius, Procyon, and Betelgeuse as part of your, uh, your challenge. So uh, remember that uh, Gemini uh, heads are the bright stars, the feet go down this way, uh, the ends of the Bull's horns are out this way. Orion, the great hunter, uh, is over this way. And he has a shield out in front of them, a little sort of club raised in this particular direction. And he's interacting with the bowl as it moves over the top. That's a lot to work with. And that's a really beautiful part of the sky. And so take this on, uh, look a little bit more, uh, give, grab some star charts, uh, uh, load, download Stellarium into your, uh, into your program. It's free. Uh, you can uh, download the Sky Safari Pro also if you want to do that. But it's a great part of the sky. It's a great thing to look for this is the time in Phoenix to be a night sky watcher because there's so many big bright stars and so many stories and so much going on here. Uh, I have used up uh, all of my time or almost all of my time so I'm going to stop sharing this I'm going to go back and just kind of recap some things that we have coming up. If you'll hang on with me for a little bit after the eight o'clock hour um, I think that will probably help.
Thank you, guys. So, Rick, I think we're just going to move right into close. Um, okay. Sounds we're not going to have a poll break or any questions. Okay. We'll uh, we'll save some poll and some questions for uh, uh, for next time. So, uh, here's how the next couple of Wednesdays are going to go, and then I will um, uh, I'll let you go tonight. Uh, so, two weeks from tonight, we're actually celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo 14. Who knew? So that particular is coming up. Remember, all of the Apollo missions kind of launched within about a three-year window. They're all sequentially celebrating their 50th anniversaries. We're going to bring on guests from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiting Camera team. Uh, they are also associated with our school and at ASU. And so we'll have guests. We'll be talking about imagery. We'll be talking about those missions, talking about what they're doing. Two weeks after that, we're going back to the Native community. We're going to have a whole evening dedicated uh, to Native star stories something we can do in the wintertime uh, culturally, and uh, that'll be kind of important. So we do that. So that's uh, not the next time, but the next one after that. After that, we will be following up because our program will be about four or five days after uh, the landing of the Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars. By the time we have our virtual night sky, we will already have some images. We will already be uh, able to report on some checking out some instruments and all of that stuff. So uh, so we're going to ask you in between time, go ahead and watch the NASA feeds. We're also going to have a part of the landing, which is happening on the 18th of February. The next Wednesday is our regular Wednesday program. We're going to follow up with uh, how we're getting some information, how we're dealing with these images and what we do with them and how that particular a part of that uh, that project works and so that'll be kind of fun and then the next one after that as i alluded to we're going to go back to the night sky we're going to talk a lot about the individual stars within all of these constellations i talked about we're going to talk about star color uh, how we type stars what the color uh, tells us about it and that will be a little bit more science into that part of the sky because it's so fun to look at and so fun to watch we've got lots and lots coming on don't forget that you guys are all in invited to the Lucy update tomorrow night. Uh, uh, hosted by the National Teachers Science Association and uh, the uh, uh, Institute for Human Origins on ASU campus, and so there uh, and 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 ourselves. So watch that tomorrow night if you want to learn more about that mission, uh, what its challenges are, and how they're getting prepared for it. And so uh, I'm going to thank my crew, thank everybody for paying attention tonight. We had a lot to go over. Uh, look forward to seeing you again. And uh, until then, we'll see you two weeks from now. Uh, just keep looking at the sky, respond to Kim Baptista's survey that she's going to send you in a couple of days, and uh, we'll meet with you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody.